Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today I brought you to one of my favorite places in the world, the mountains, to talk about my favorite statistical technique, the general linear model. My teacher, Marcello Gallucci, once stated that if you're only going to learn one statistical technique really well, make it the general linear model. Because this technique is so flexible, you can expand it to test almost any research question and you can build many models using just elements of this technique. And today we're going to introduce you to the very first member of the family that is known as the general linear model, and that is bivariate linear regression. So what is the general linear model? The general linear model is a family of models that can be used to analyze the relationship between one outcome and one or more predictors. And today we introduce the most basic element of that family, bivariate linear regression. It describes a linear relationship between a continuous outcome variable and a continuous predictor. But let me just preface some of the other techniques that we're going to encounter, which are all members of this family. For example, you will learn how to include predictors of any measurement level, including continuous or categorical predictors, you will learn to include more than one predictor. You will learn how to include transformations of the dependent variable y and the independent variable x in order to model nonlinear associations. And you will learn how to include other error distributions than the normal distribution. And there are many more extensions imaginable. So with all this in mind, let's get into linear regression. And first, let's try to gain an intuitive understanding of the technique. Let's perform a thought experiment. If I told you that last year's average exam grade was 6.1, what grade would you expect to get for this year's exam? So hopefully your intuition tells you that you should expect to get a grade around the average. That's why the average is also called the expected value. But if I additionally told you that our studied is strongly associated with the exam grade and you know that you studied far more than average, does that change your expectation for the grade? And hopefully your intuition also tells you that you can expect a slightly higher grade than the average. So what does this intuitive example demonstrate? Well, two things. First of all, that the mean is the best predictor it is the expected value when there's no further relevant information. But second, if you do have relevant information about other variables that are associated with the outcome, you can use that information to improve your predictions. And that is what regression is all about, making better predictions based on information about other variables. So let's visualize the situation in a scatter plot. And this figure here at the bottom of the slide is a scatter plot. It's a two dimensional plot with the predictor on the x axis and the outcome on the y axis. That's conventional. That's also why we call the outcome y and the predictor x sometimes. And each of these little points represents an individual score on both variables. So here we have probably about 75 or 100 students and their scores on grade and their number of hours studied. So we could plot the mean value of the outcome in this graph and that's the dashed line you see here. So the mean grade was 6.1 and if there were no association between hours studied and grade obtained then this mean value y bar would be the best prediction for each student. We also call that the null model. The null model predicts the outcome from its mean value. In this graph, we can visualize prediction error because using the mean as a prediction for each student's grade will give us a wrong prediction for most students. For example, this student right here had a much higher grade than the mean and the difference between our predicted grade of the mean and their obtained grade is visualized by this blue bar. So we see a very long blue bar and that means that this student had a very large prediction error. And here we see a student who scored much lower than the mean and they also have a very large prediction error. But for some students here, the mean is actually a pretty good prediction. 
But notice that all of those points appear to chase an imaginary diagonal line upward. They're not all just clustered around the horizontal line of the mean. Can we do anything with that observation? Well, the fact that there's this diagonally upwards trend between our studied and grade suggests that there might be an association between the two variables. If we were to calculate prediction errors around such a diagonal line, we would immediately observe that the distances of points from this diagonal line are much smaller than the distances from the straight line of the mean. In fact, this diagonal line is the line that minimizes the overall prediction errors. So this is the best possible line with the smallest possible prediction errors across our whole sample. We can use this line to make personalized predictions about the grade someone is going to get. So imagine that you studied on average five hours per week. Then you could just follow this dashed line upwards until you meet this diagonal line and then go to the left and guess that you are going to get a grade of approximately 6.8. So somewhat higher than the sample average of 6.1. Now, as you might remember from high school, any diagonal line can be described by this formula, y equals a plus bx. And in that formula, a is the intercept, that's the value at which the diagonal line intersects the y-axis, and b is the slope of the diagonal line. If we go up by one unit on the x-axis, we go b units up on the y-axis. A and B in this formula are called coefficients or parameters. So in this formula, there are two parameters or two coefficients, A and B, where A is the intercept, that's where the line crosses the y-axis, and it's also the predicted value when x equals zero. And B is the slope, and it tells us how steeply the line increases or decreases, if it's a negative value, Specifically, y increases by b points when x increases by 1 point. So we can use this diagonal line to predict values of the outcome y for individuals sub i. And then we get the predicted value, we call it y hat sub i, and the hat is this little caret symbol above the y. And this prediction y hat sub i is never identical to the observed value of the individual y sub i. There's always some prediction error, y sub i minus the predicted value y hat sub i. So for example, for an individual who studied four hours, we would predict a grade of 6.1 by following this diagonal line. But this individual right here actually scored an 8.8. .8. So the prediction error for that individual is the difference between 8.8 .8 and the predicted value 6.1. So I mentioned before that this line here is actually the line that minimizes the prediction errors across all individuals. And we estimate it using a technique called ordinary least squares. What we want to do is obtain a line out of all of the possible lines that we could draw that gives us the best possible predictions across all participants. And of course, there exist values of the parameters A and B that give us this line with the best possible predictions. And luckily, those can be easily calculated with matrix algebra, but that's not part of this course. Although if you're interested, you can find really good explanations on YouTube. This ordinary least squares line goes exactly through the middle of the cloud of data points from all participants. This also minimizes the squared prediction errors across all participants, which I will explain in more detail next week. But because it minimizes the squared prediction errors, this method is called the ordinary least squares regression. Let's walk through a simple numeric example where we substitute specific values for the coefficients. So for this data set that we've been looking at, the intercept of the ordinary least squares regression line is actually 2.9 and the slope is 0.8. So 
The function to predict individual's grades, y hat sub i, is equal to 2.9 plus 0 0.8 times x sub i. Now let's consider student number 71 out of this whole class. That student has studied 4 hours per week, so we can calculate that student's predicted grade, y hat sub 71, as 2.9 plus 0 0.8 times 4 hours studied equals 6.1. But in reality, that student's grade was 8.8. .8. So the prediction error was the difference between their observed value, 8.8, .8, and their predicted value, 6.1. So the prediction error for that student was 2.7. I already mentioned that any diagonal line can be described by the formula y equals a plus bx. But this formula does not yet describe this prediction error that we just calculated. We can complete the regression formula to fully describe the data by expanding the formula to include the prediction error as well. And then the formula reads the individual values on the outcome variable y are equal to some intercept a plus a regression slope b times the individual values on the predictor x plus individual prediction errors epsilon sub i. So this epsilon sub i term refers to the individual prediction errors. And importantly, we assume that those prediction errors are normally distributed. And we write that by saying that epsilon sub i is distributed as a normal distribution with a mean of zero and some error variance. And this mean of zero actually implies that the prediction errors are distributed around the regression line. Which makes sense because, like I explained, the regression line is exactly in the middle of the data cloud. So let's break down this bivariate regression formula. In this table we have the symbol on the left and its interpretation on the right. So y sub i is individual i's score on dependent variable y. a is a coefficient, specifically the intercept of the regression line. b is also a coefficient, specifically the slope of the regression line x sub i is individual i's score on independent variable x and epsilon sub i is individual i's prediction error. So in words this formula says the individual values on variable y are equal to the intercept plus the slope times the individual values on the predictor x plus individual prediction error. I want to warn you ahead of time that this same formula can be written many different ways. The symbols are, in a sense, arbitrary, so be ready to see it in different forms. So here's another notation that you will often see, where instead of using a and b for our model parameters, we use b sub 0 to reference the intercept and b sub 1 to reference the regression slope. So y sub i is sometimes called the outcome and it's sometimes called the dependent variable, which can be abbreviated as dv. The intercept a is also often called b sub zero, and if we're talking about the value in the population, that could be beta sub zero. The regression slope b is also often called b sub one, and if we're talking about its population value, that could be beta sub one. And x sub i is also called the predictor, or the independent variable, which is abbreviated to iv. And then we have the prediction error, epsilon sub i, and that's sometimes written with different types of epsilons as well. It's also worth noting the distinction between the observed and the predicted value. So the observed value is y sub i, and the predicted value is just the value on the regression line for that individual. And we write it as y hat sub i, and it is equal to a plus b times x sub i, and then we can add the prediction error to the predicted value to get the observed value. So this formula here states that the individual values on variable y are equal to the predicted values plus individual prediction errors. And this is the complete regression formula that describes the entire data set that you've obtained. Now once you've estimated your linear regression model, you may want to test specific hypotheses about the coefficients in that model. 
So let's have a closer look at how to go about this. We can perform hypothesis tests on the coefficients a and b. And for this purpose we can just reuse the t-test that you learned last week. Most software by default uses a two-sided test with a zero null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis h null is that beta is equal to zero. The population value of beta is equal to zero. But you can perform custom tests if you want. So how do we test coefficients? Well, first of all, remember that hypotheses are statements about the population. So we use Greek symbols for population parameters. If we want to test the hypothesis that the intercept is equal to zero, we would say h null is that beta zero is equal to zero. Or if we want to test a null hypothesis about the slope, we could say h zero is that beta sub one is equal to zero. And then we use the t distribution because we typically don't know the population variance of either x or y. So this t distribution helps us account for the additional uncertainty incurred by not knowing the population variance of these variables, as I explained last week. But for samples that exceed a size of about 30, this is almost the same as using the z distribution. So if you have large samples, the difference becomes negligible. If we are testing a zero null hypothesis, then we can simply calculate the t-test statistic by dividing the value of the coefficient by its standard error. The degrees of freedom of this t-test are the number of participants n minus the number of parameters p. And for bivariate linear regression, the number of parameters is just two, the intercept and the slope. So we can visualize this t-test as follows. We draw a distribution around the hypothesized value. So in this case, we're all testing zero null hypotheses. So the mean of that distribution is zero. If we are testing at a significance level of 0.05, then we have 2.5% probability in the left tail and the right tail. And then we can use a table or a calculator to find the critical t values at which we would start rejecting this null hypothesis. So here for a very large sample those critical values are around minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. So here's some output from the statistical software SPSS which performs a test on both the intercept and the slope. The results are found in a table called coefficients and we see that the intercept here is called the constant, and that's just a different name for the intercept. And we see that the slope is labeled with the name of the variable, which is in Dutch, but this just says hours studied, and the dependent variable is exam grade. So both of these hypotheses tests are testing default zero null hypotheses, which I already explained. So the null hypothesis for the intercept is that beta sub zero is equal to zero that asks the question whether the intercept is significantly different from zero. So let's look at that test. The value of the coefficient is 1.31. Its standard error is 0.97. If we divide 1.31 by 0.97, we get the t statistic of 1.36. And that is much smaller than our critical value of 1.96. So we get a non-significant test with a p-value greater than 0.05. But for the slope, we see that the value of the coefficient is 0.67 and its standard error is 0.12. If we divide those two, we get a t-statistic of 5.47, which is much larger than our critical value of 1.96. So unsurprisingly, its p-value is extremely small and we reject the null hypothesis that the slope is equal to zero. But note that you can use this output to perform custom tests as well. So let's do a simple one-sided hypothesis test instead. In this case, we believe that the effect will be positive. So our null hypothesis is in contradistinction to our true belief. So our null hypothesis is that b sub one is equal to or smaller than zero and our true belief represented by the alternative hypothesis is that beta sub 1 will be greater than 0. To perform a custom one-sided hypothesis test, 
we first have to check if the observed effect is in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. If that is the case, we can simply divide the p-value by 2 to perform a one-sided test. So in this case, the p-value is already extremely small. Let's assume that it's 0 0.001. Well, because our observed slope is in the direction of the alternative hypothesis greater than 0, we can divide that tiny p-value by 2 again. So let's say that it was 0 0.001, we divide by 2, then it becomes 0 0.0005, which we would still round up to p is smaller than 0 0.001, so there's no practical difference here. But sometimes it does make a difference. Another custom test might be about the intercept. So you might wonder, what happens if I study zero hours? Should I still expect to get a passing grade for this course? So a passing grade for this course is 5.5 .5 on a 10 point scale. So the null hypothesis here would be that the intercept is smaller than or equal to 5.5. .5. And now we can calculate the t statistic by subtracting this hypothesized value of 5.5 .5 from the observed value of the intercept, which is 1.31. So we take 1.31 minus 5.5 .5 and divide that by the standard error of the intercept, which was 0.97 and we get a t-value of minus 4.32. Now note that this effect is not in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Instead, it is congruent with the null hypothesis, so we're never going to reject that null hypothesis. So in this case, there's no evidence to believe that you would pass the course if you studied zero hours. How do we report the results of tests on model coefficients? Well, for example, we could say that the effect of hours studied on exam grade was significant with a B of 0.67, a T value with 90 degrees of freedom of 5.47 and a P value smaller than 0 0.001. This means that for every additional hour studied, the expected grade increased by 0 0.67. By the way, note that this Degrees of freedom for the t-test was calculated as n minus p, the sample size minus the number of parameters. We have two parameters, so the sample size must have been 92 students. The last topic we'll discuss today are the assumptions of bivariate linear regression. Any model is a simplified description of the data, and it makes certain assumptions about what those data look like. When those assumptions are violated, any inferences that you draw from that model can't be trusted. So let's have a closer look at what those assumptions are. Any statistical model is only valid if its assumptions are met. So a model is a simplified representation of data, and if its assumptions are violated, it misrepresents those data. And a consequence of this are that any tests that we perform using that model will provide misleading conclusions, and inferences drawn from them will not be justified. What we can do is try to check the assumptions. But keep in mind that no evidence of violation is not the same as evidence of no violation. What do I mean by that? Well, consider the following. If you look up the word assumption in a dictionary, you will find a definition, something that you accept as true without question or proof. And there's a very important lesson here because an assumption is a statement about the population. For example, residuals are normally distributed. That's a statement about residuals in the population. But we only have access to a sample, so we never really know if that assumption is true or false. All we can do is check whether in this sample it is true or false, but the sample may not be representative of the population. But if we tailor our analysis based on assumption checks in the sample, we risk overfitting the model. So what would happen there is that we have a model, we perform a bunch of assumption checks, and based on the results of those assumption checks, we change the model until it describes our data in the sample much better. But in doing so, we lose some of its generalizability to the larger population to which we have no access. So how should you go about this? Well, what I would advise you to do is to develop your model based on theory, 
and then perform assumption checks anyway, just as a matter of due diligence, and report on them and reflect on the implications that any violated assumptions might have for inferences you draw from your model. But don't just blindly change your model to satisfy the assumption checks. Just have some critical discussion about what it means for your conclusions if some of the assumptions are violated. So what are the assumptions of linear regression? Well, they can be summarized as follows. One assumption is that the model is correctly specified. And that includes that the relationship between predictor X and outcome Y should be linear. Another assumption is that the residuals should be normally distributed. Another assumption relates to the direction of causality. And this point is rarely discussed. A critical insight is that you cannot use the results of regression analysis to conclude that there is a causal relationship between your predictor and your outcome. Instead, the direction of causality is one of the assumptions of your model if you want to interpret the results causally. Think about the example where we discussed our studied and grade obtained. I'm perfectly comfortable assuming that if you study more hours, that will cause an increase in your grade. So I'm going to interpret the results of that regression analysis causally. But what I can't do is go into it without any preconceived notions about causality, observe that the regression coefficient is significant, and then conclude that there is a causal effect. The causality is an assumption of your model, not a conclusion of your analysis. A second assumption of linear regression is that the residuals, so the prediction errors, are not just normally distributed, but also equally distributed for all values of the predictor. And this is called homoscedasticity. It comes from the Greek and it just means equal variance. Specifically, equal variance along all values of the predictor. And a third assumption relates to independence of observations. Let's get into each of these assumptions a little deeper. First, how can we check whether the relationship between X and Y is actually linear? Well, one simple technique is just to do a visual check by creating a scatter plot, like we've done in our running example, and looking whether the points seem to follow a straight line or not. Another way to check for linearity is to look at a residual plot. Here we have the standardized predictor on the x-axis, and we have the standardized prediction error on the y-axis. There's a horizontal line around zero, and what we would like to see is that there's kind of a random cloud around that zero line. That suggests that the relationship is linear. But if we see any kind of pattern among the prediction errors, that suggests that the relationship is not linear. So what, kind, what, do, vi so what do violations of linearity look like? Well, here we have four images. This is called Anscombe's Quartet. And in the top left, we see the prototypical perfect linear association. So what we see is that all of the points seem to chase an imaginary line diagonally upwards. And if we model this with linear regression, that's a very good model. But in the top right, we see that the data points seem to chase an imaginary curved line. So if we model this with linear regression, we're violating that assumption of linearity. In this case, the association between X and Y is perfect, but not linear. So one reason why the assumption of linearity might be violated is because the association between X and Y has a different functional form than just a linear shape. The assumption of linearity can also be violated because of outliers. And that's what we see in these bottom two pictures. So in the left picture in the bottom row, we see that there's a perfect linear association between most data points, but there is one specific data point that's causing trouble, and it really pulls the whole regression line out of whack. So in this case, linearity is violated by this single outlier. And this case is kind of funny because what we see here is that the variable X really isn't a variable. It's basically a constant because nearly every observation in our data set has the value eight for the predictor X, 
except for this one outlier. And there appears to be a linear relationship only because of this one outlier. And if we remove that outlier, there would just be a horizontal relationship. Also, you can't really estimate a relationship between a constant and a variable. So in this case, linear regression is the wrong technique to describe these data. And using a scatter plot really helps you diagnose these different situations. A second assumption that I mentioned is that the residuals are normally distributed. But we might ask the question, why are residuals normally distributed? Well, if you're really interested in this, you can search for Galton board on Google. So the Galton board demonstrates that any outcome that is the result of many independent random processes tends to produce a normal distribution. In this Galton board, you pour a bucket of marbles down the front of a board with many nails hammered into it, and the marbles bounce off of each nail, and then they roll left or right of the nail. And if you do this, the marbles will stack up on the bottom of the board in the shape of a normal distribution. It's almost like magic. But what it illustrates is that any time many different and independent random processes have an effect on your outcome, it will result in a normal distribution. So how does this relate to our linear regression? Well, basically what we're saying when we assume that residuals are normally distributed is that our outcome variable is a linear function of our predictor plus many other random independent processes. So how can we assess this assumption of normality? Well, first of all, we can use plots such as a histogram or a normal PP plot or a QQ plot. So let's have a quick look at those. On the right, we see a histogram of the residuals of some regression analysis. And we already looked at these in previous weeks. So the histogram shows you the observed residuals as yellow bars. And then we see an idealized normal distribution as this black curved line. So if the residuals were indeed normally distributed, the yellow bars of the histogram would closely follow this curved line of the ideal normal distribution. But we see that that's not the case. Specifically, I would expect a lot more values here around the mean. And I would expect fewer values greater than the mean and fewer values lower than the mean. So basically what we see here is that there are fewer residuals around zero and more residuals slightly below that and slightly above that. The PP plot is the one on the left, and it plots the observed cumulative probability of observing different scores on the residuals against the expected cumulative probability of observing different scores if this variable was perfectly normally distributed. So if our residuals are perfectly normal, then all of the points in this plot should closely follow that diagonal line. But what we see is that they don't. In fact, we see some deviations slightly below the middle point of the line, and we see some deviations slightly above the middle point of the line. So that mirrors what we see in the histogram. So again, we have some slight evidence of deviations from normality from observing these plots. But plots can be hard to interpret, especially if you just start out. So we also have some statistics to diagnose deviations from normal residuals. And these are the Kolmogorov Smirnov test and the Shapiro Wilkes test. So, for both of these tests, the null hypothesis is that there is no deviation from normality. And if we observe a significant test result, there is evidence of violations from normally distributed residuals. If either of these two tests is significant, that might be a cause for concern that there are deviations from the assumption of normal residuals. So they don't both need to be significant, but either of them can be used to diagnose potential violations of this assumption. Another assumption is that residuals are not just normally distributed, but also equally distributed along all predicted scores for the outcome. And to diagnose this, we can ask for a residual plot. It shows the standardized predicted values on the x-axis and the standardized residuals on the y-axis. So let's look at some examples. 
Here on the left, we have a residual plot that shows homoscedasticity. The points are kind of homogeneously distributed around the zero line in what I would call a vegan sausage shape. So if your residuals are skewered around the zero line like a sausage, that looks like they are homoscedastic. But if they deviate from that sausage shape, like the ones in the plot here on the right, then we have indications of heteroscedasticity, which is the opposite of homoscedasticity. And that means unequal variances. So here we see that the variance around low values of the standardized predicted value is much smaller than the variance around high values of the standardized predicted value. And it looks kind of like a funnel shape, right? The higher you get on the predicted value, the wider the variance is. And this looks like heteroscedasticity, so a violation of the assumption of homoscedasticity. But note that it doesn't need to be a funnel shape. Any deviation from the sausage shape can indicate heteroscedasticity. And actually, we already saw a residual plot before, namely this one. And here, the one on the left also shows us that sausage shape that indicates homoscedasticity. And the one on the right shows us heteroscedasticity, but this time for a different reason. This time, because the residuals are kind of U-shaped around the zero line. And actually, you get those U-shaped residuals when there is a curvilinear relationship in your data. So you see how sometimes violations of homoscedasticity can hang together with violations of linearity, etc. The final assumption relates to independent observations. Your data points should be independent from one another. Every observation should convey unique information. If this assumption is violated, then your effective sample size is lower than the number of rows in your data set. And the consequence of that is that you may underestimate your uncertainty about parameter estimates. In other words, your standard errors are a bit smaller than they should be. And how can we best satisfy this assumption? Well, just by randomly drawing samples from the population. And what does a violation of this assumption look like? Well, for example, if students cheat on an exam, if they look at what their neighbor is answering, that violates the assumption of independence. Or if you collect data from married couples. Married couples tend to be more similar than randomly selected people from the population. So you don't get as much unique information from two married partners as you would get from two random people from the population. But also, if you administer a questionnaire to all children within the same class, they will likely be more similar than randomly selected children because they have the same teacher, they've been studying the same materials, they may have a more similar background if they live in a similar neighborhood, etc. So the problem is that dependent observations are more similar than randomly sampled ones. So each dependent sample gives you slightly less unique information. For example, if you have 10 couples who are very similar to each other and you compute standard errors by dividing by the square root of 20, that will be too small. So the problem is that you would underestimate the uncertainty of your estimates by getting standard errors that are slightly too small. So you would have to ideally correct for that. If you know why cases in your data set are dependent, for example, because they are married couples or because they are children in the same class, then there are solutions to control for that. But that's unfortunately not part of this course. So how do we deal with violations of assumptions? Well, first of all, we do not blindly change our analyses to better fit the data from the sample, because that might reduce the generalizability of our model to the population. And second of all, we always include a critical reflection on what the violation of assumptions might mean for our inferences in our discussion section of our report or our scientific paper. And just to give you a little taste of different solutions that do exist, how would we deal with a violation of linearity? Well, we could transform the predictor variable to model a different functional form 
and we could include a quadratic term in our model to describe a u-shaped or a v-shaped relationship. If the assumption of normality of residuals is violated, we could increase the sample size because sometimes normality is violated only because your sample is too small. It's hard for something to look normal if you have too few observations to get a normal distribution. But it's also possible to use a different distribution for your residuals, such as the binomial distribution, and some of you will actually learn about this. And there are non-parametric approaches that don't assume any kind of distribution for the residuals. Sometimes removing outliers can be a solution if that's the cause of the violation of normality. If the assumption of homoscedasticity is violated, it may be possible to explain away the reason of the heteroscedasticity. So for example, imagine that men's scores vary more than women's scores, then you might account for participant sex to reduce the source of heteroscedasticity. Or again, you can use a non-parametric approach that does not assume homoscedasticity. And if the assumption of independent observations is violated, you could account for group membership, but that's not part of the course. And this is just kind of a tasting menu for all of the solutions that do exist. Some of those we will cover in the course and others you will have to look up on the internet if you ever run into that problem. That's it for today. By learning bivariate linear regression, you already have a very powerful and useful tool under your belt. And in the coming weeks, we're going to further expand upon this theme of the general linear model. I'm going to climb this mountain. Good luck to you for the tutorials and see you next week.